let everybody get settled. All right. Good evening. Ah, can't speak. Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Um, my name is Julie Wheeler. I'm the Intergovernmental Relations Officer for Travis County and was one of the lucky co-conspirators um, of our very early efforts to try to put together a joint collaboration between the county and the city as it related to the census. We started as early as 2017 with the idea that if we could come together and work together, we could do better than we did in 2010. We knew that if we could come together and do better and put together resources for our communities, they could do better. Um, I'm so excited to be here tonight to see what was able to come to fruition. It far exceeds what any of us back in 2017 thought could happen. Um, just as a reminder, we are at stage three COVID protocols. I have my mask off at the moment. I will have it back on again later this evening. There's plenty of seating though, if you all wanna spread apart. Um, I know that there is something about parking, but we'll tell you that at the end of this event. Um, this evening, we're going to have a number of things that we go through. So we're going to start off with a presentation from Dr. Lila Valencia, who is the City of Austin demographer. Um, and then we'll go into a panel discussion with members of our community CCCs. But before that, I am very excited to introduce Mayor Pro Tem Alter, who is the co-sponsor along with Councilmember Natasha Harper-Madison on a resolution um, recognizing everybody's hard efforts and the census celebration that we are here for tonight. So I'll pass it over to you. Good evening. It is so wonderful to be here in person um, with all of you who've made such a huge difference in our community. Um, I know most of you, but for those who I don't know, my name is Allison Alter, and I serve as Mayor Pro Tem of the City of Austin, and I represent District 10, Central Northwest Austin, on the City Council. Um, thank you for being here tonight as we celebrate um, the work of everyone who put time and energy into making our Census 2020 count a success. Um, I so wish we could have done this a long time ago. It's not lost on me that it is 2022 um, at this point. Um, you navigated so much with the pandemic and with very little help um, from the state, um, from the state or from the federal government. Um, and, you know, we needed you and you showed up and thank you. A growing city such as ours requires an accurate census that reflects the full spectrum of our community and all its diversity. As you all know well, every single person counts. That is how we get federal funding. That is how we get fair representation in government. And that is how public servants can have the best data to inform decisions that will affect the entire community. I am so proud of how we, the city, county, and community came together to make this happen. We were able to achieve a 67.3% self-response rate, second only to El Paso in our state. But not only that, we beat our 2010 response rate, and we could not have done any of this without your leadership. The mayor tonight is at the US Conference of Mayors Leadership event in Miami and could not be with us tonight. Um, as he was very involved with all of you in this process, he asked me to share a few words specifically on his behalf. Given the incredible importance of the census and the failure of the state to provide any meaningful support for your efforts, I was so proud and impressed by how much the census team was able to accomplish. Please know that your actions, which will bring us closer to a just society, are appreciated and will have helped secure a better future for all Austinites. Every time I joined you for your meetings at the Travis County Building, I left inspired. Today, we say thank you to the census team. So on behalf of all of the city council and our staff, I would like to thank you um, for making the Census 2020 work for Austin. I hope to see you all tomorrow morning at 9.30 for the proclamation. Thank you so much. 
as mentioned, there will be a proclamation tomorrow morning um, in council chambers at 9.30. Um, also, you can go and visit and watch that on the website. It's austintexas.atxn. I think I got that wrong. I am so sorry. Um, but I will provide you with that as soon as I find. Sorry. austintexas.gov slash atxn is where you can go watch that live tomorrow. Um, this presentation will also be broadcast on there as well if you're not able to attend here in person with us this evening. Before we begin our presentation by Dr. Valencia, I want to introduce City of Austin Housing and Planning Director, Dr. Rosie Trulove. Thank you. I will say I'm not a, do I'm not a doctor, um, and that's okay. Um, thank you all. Thank you, Julie, for uh, introducing me, and thank you to, Council, to Mayor Pro Tem Alter for being here tonight. Um, by now, saying that the last few years were challenging would be the understatement of the decade. Uh, and as I say that, I hear my 14-year-old my in my ear uh, making some very snarky comments about the level of exaggeration that, I'm, that I am saying. Uh, but like almost everything else in 2020, last year's uh, census had its share of obstacles. A global pandemic changing how we interact, increasing public distrust, social injustices, and a proposal to add a citizenship question to the census hung a dark cloud over this critical initiative. Despite this, you all pressed on. Through your efforts, Austin Travis County was the only city county pair in Texas to surpass its own previous census participation for 2010. That's why we've asked you all here this evening to reflect on the culmination of months of outreach and organizing on the part of dozens of institutional and grassroots partners to see and discuss why this work is so important. On behalf of the city of Austin, I'd like to thank Travis County and our partners across the 32 diverse groups of this community for your unwavering commitment to this endeavor. And I would also like to introduce Cupid Alexander, Assistant Director for the Housing and Planning Department to share a few words. Thank you, Dr. Rosie Trulo, who, who plays a doctor on TV. Um, it's really amazing to think that a 10 minute act can affect every central Texan for the next 10 years of their lives. This lasting ripple effect is why we're here this evening we know that a fair and healthy democracy requires a fair census process, a process that seeks to count everyone, regardless of origin or status, to properly fund our schools, transportation, and healthcare, a process that preserves and advances voting rights at all levels of government. We learned a lot in 2020 about ourselves and our communities, we learned how well we can adjust and overcome challenges in our way. We learned what we can be accomplished through collaboration and strong connections. So I wanna thank you all for your partnership. I'm confident that we can carry this knowledge and these relationships into 2030. Now I'm happy to introduce City of Austin demographer, my friend, your friend, our friend, Dr. Lila Valencia. Got to bring the mic down a little. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. I'm so excited to be here with you today to discuss the findings of the 2020 census count. I had the opportunity to see firsthand the incredible efforts the Austin Travis County Complete Count Committee put forth to ensure an accurate count for their communities, even amidst the most incredibly challenging circumstances. So I see the data that I'm gonna share with you today a little bit like the fruits of your labor, your collective labor. I know the count we received for the city is a little lower than some were expecting, and we're using all the tools and processes available to verify this count, including the Census Bureau's count question resolution operation. But I want the members of the Complete Count Committee to know that their work was remarkable, and really exceeded expectations, given all of the circumstances. And we're 
it, it helped to make sure that the Austin Travis County, like Rosie mentioned earlier, was the only large city county pair to surpass their 2010 response efforts. And so that's something you should be really proud of. So let me go ahead and start sharing some of these findings that I have for you today. Next slide, please. The data that I'm gonna share with you come from the, the redistricting file from the US Census Bureau, and it was really the first opportunity that communities had to get their first look at that 2020 census count. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. In Austin, the latest census data reveal continued growth for the city. Austin has been uh, growing about 20 to, or doubling its population about every 20 to 25 years. And so for instance, you see here in 1970, we're at about a quarter million people. Between 1990 and 2000, we're uh, about the half, we've surpassed the half million mark. And then now in 2020, we're at 961,855 people. The city of Austin added over 171,000 people during this time. Next, next slide, please. And really, the city of Austin it remains the 11th largest uh, city in the country, but it's really rivaling the growth of some of the nation's largest cities. So you see here, Austin was the fourth, uh, added the fourth highest number of people between 2010 and 2020, with only cities like New York and Houston adding more people, as well as the city of Fort Worth. Next slide, please. Here we take a regional look at the Austin metropolitan growth. The Austin metro grew, was the fastest growing metro every single year uh, in this last decade. And for as fast as Austin is growing, the metro is growing even faster. Austin grew at a rate of about 21.7%, and the metro area is growing at a rate of 33%. Austin contributed about 30% of that total growth to the metro in the last decade. And with Hayes and Williamson County among the nation's fastest growing counties, it's clear that our region is growing, and it's growing rapidly. Next slide, please. When we look at surrounding cities, we also see a similar pattern. Again, for as fast as Austin is growing, the surrounding cities are growing even faster. Some of the central cities that are listed here have topped the list of the Census Bureau's fastest growing cities in the country, including Leander and Cedar Park, but also growing very rapidly are Maynard, Buda, and Hutto. And I'd like to note that although Austin's share of the metro growth is not what it was in the past, and although some of the surrounding areas are growing much faster, the bulk of the growth is still taking place in the city of Austin. Its largest neighbor to the north, Round Rock, had a growth that was about the tenth of what was added to the Austin population. And even the large growth seen in Leander is only about two-tenths of the growth that we saw here in Austin. So Austin continues to be a significant population growth engine for the region. Next slide, please. And as population has grown in the city, so has the number of housing units. In 2020, there were 444,426 housing units in Austin. And it, uh, that increased by 90,185 since 2010. And it grew, and we were able to add these um, housing units at a growth rate of about 25.5%. One thing I want to note is that although the number of housing units is um, larger than it has been in decades past, the rate of growth did slow down between 2010 and 2020. And then another thing I want to note is that these data just look at all housing units, and they don't really take into account different characteristics that could really further inform how well the housing stock actually is meeting the needs of the housing uh, of the population. So let's talk a little bit more about that population. Next slide, please. Really, two more slides. So this slide is like the visual representation of our city's diversity. And I want to mention uh, right off the bat, the city's population growth extended across all race ethnicity groups, as I tried to um, you know, sort of demonstrate in the smaller pie for 2010 compared to the larger pie in 2020. 
And although no race ethnicity group makes up a majority, the non-Hispanic white population really drew, um, drove growth in the city of Austin, and they make up about 47% of the total population. This was a slight drop of, uh, from nearly 49% in 2010. The Hispanic population also saw a decrease in its share from uh, 2010. Hispanics dropped about three percentage points and now make up 32.5% of the total uh, population. The Asian population is now the third largest race ethnicity group in the city, and it makes up nearly 9% of the total population, up from 6% in 2010. The black population now makes up 7% of the total population, and this is about one percentage point lower than at the start of the decade. Next slide, please. Now, throughout the country, the populations of color really drove population growth. So for instance, here in the state of Texas, 95% uh, of the growth that took place during the last decade was driven by non-white populations. In the city of Austin, we're seeing a bit of a unique diversity. While the, uh, the white population continues to make up the largest share, and it is really driving growth, with nearly 40% of all growth um, being contributed by the non-Hispanic white population. They, are, they expanded by over 67,000 to a total population of 452,000 people. And this is at a time when the country experienced for the first time in 230 years a decrease in the number of people who identified as non-Hispanic white. So seeing such strong growth among this community in Austin is truly unique. Now, the fastest growing race groups in, uh, in, in our city are those individuals that looked at the census uh, form and said, there is no race group that identifies me here. And so they identified as some other race group, as well as the multiracial group. They uh, more than doubled in size, and these groups have been fast growing for a couple of, for a couple of decades now. The Asian population was the fastest growing single race group. And over one in five of every five people that were added to the Austin population in the last decade were of Asian descent. Hispanics made up about 20% of the growth in the city in the last decade. This compares with about 50% at the national and at the state level. Hispanic residents grew by 34,000 to a total population of 312, 448 people. The African American population also grew this decade, but at a slower rate. The black population grew by 5,242 people to a total of 66,002 persons. This is in the context of very strong migration by African Americans to cities in the South, including Dallas and Houston. And I'll give you just one example. The city of Fort Worth, that's similarly sized to the city of Austin, added nearly 40,000 African Americans compared to our 5,000. And they added 67,000 Hispanics compared to our 34,000 that were added. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The redistricting data provide information on the total population as well as the voting age population. So if we subtract those from each other, we can also look at the child population. And demographers like to do that so that we can get a glimpse of what the future of, of that uh, population may look like. In Austin, the adult population consists of about 775,000 adults. And the child population is about 186,000 adults. And this is about, so they make up about 15% of the total population. This is in line with most um, national um, percentages as well. But one thing that we notice in the city of Austin is the adult population is a little less diverse than the total population. And it's also becoming increasingly less diverse. So while I told you no group holds a majority in the total population, among those 18 and older, just over half identify as non-Hispanic white. And this is compared to 42.5% that identified as non-Hispanic white in 2010. The child population is much more diverse, with 67% identifying as non-white and Latinos making up the largest share. Next slide, please. Growth in the child population was really driven by the Asian population, the non-Hispanic white population, and the multiracial population. 
In fact, of every 10 children that were added in the last decade, six of those children were of Asian descent. But this also was paired with a drop in the number of Latino and black children that we saw between 2010 and 2020. Next slide, please. And now I'm gonna share with you a couple of maps that look at the geographic distribution of the population. This first map looks at the population change between 2010 and 2020, and areas of growth can be shown in blue, and areas of decline can be shown in red. And what you can see here is that there is significant growth, especially in those areas right between Travis County and Williamson County, as well as in Hayes County, and then the outer areas of the city of Austin. Some of this um, is due to the nature of the geographies that we're looking at. As you move farther away from a city, um, those geographies become larger in land area, and so they tend to stand out in maps like these. But there definitely is some indication of sprawl as well. Now, this, is, has, this has been happening in the city of Austin and in most large urban areas throughout the country, and especially in the state of Texas. What we are also seeing, though, is when we really zoom into the central parts of the city where more dense development was encouraged, we are seeing similar population increases as in those areas as we are to some of those areas farther out in the fringes. And what we can see here is that we see a lot of growth, for instance, in Mueller, in the domain developments, as well as parts of downtowns and around the University of Texas campus. Next slide, please. Now this map here shows how fast some of these areas are growing. And so the faster growing areas can be seen in shades of blue, and then those areas that are declining rapidly can be seen in shades of red. And we see, again, a lot of growth, a lot of very fast growth between Travis County and Williamson County around Leander, Cedar Park, and the Liberty Hill areas. Next slide, please. And then in this next series of maps, what I'm going to show you is the share of a particular race ethnicity group in parts of Austin with higher shares shown in darker shades of green. And then the numeric change uh, for the map for you on the left in, um, with growth shown in yellow and then um, decline shown in blue. This set of maps looks at the geographic distribution of the Asian population with the highest share seen in parts of Northwest Austin and uh, greatest growth shown in Northeast, Northwest, the domain area and around the University of Texas campus. We also see some areas of decline in the Asian population, particularly around Tech Ridge, the Schofield, Lamplight Village area as well. Next map, please, or next slide, please. This set of maps looks at the geographic distribution of the African American population. And we see the highest shares uh, east of MLK and 183. And we see very fast growth in Northeast Austin as well as far South Austin. Most notably, what we see in this map, however, are that there are many areas of the city where the black population is in decline, especially in North Austin, Far East Austin, as well as South Austin. Next slide, please. And then this set of maps looks at the geographic distribution of the Hispanic population, with the highest shares seen all along Highway 130, as well as in the North Lamar and North, North Dessa areas. Fast growth is seen in Northeast Austin and Southeast Austin, uh, and as well as uh, Southeast Travis County, indicating a further eastward movement of that Eastern Crescent that we sometimes talk about. We also see steep declines in parts of historic East Austin and South Austin, including neighborhoods like Montopolis and the Dove Springs. Next slide, please. And this is the last set of maps that I have, and it includes the geographic distribution of the non-Hispanic white population. The highest shares, of course, are located west of I-35. We've seen this map a number of times before. But what we're seeing now in these new census data is that there are also increasingly higher shares immediately east of I-35 in parts of historic East Austin. And then uh, areas of growth can be seen all along the perimeter of the city and in many parts of historic East Austin, including the Holly neighborhood. But we also see some um, growth in the denser areas of the city, including the domain and parts of downtown. 
And then we see declines uh, in both parts of Northwest Austin as well as around the University of Texas area. Next slide, please. So while these findings offer, um, these findings suggest that we are uh, still having to do some work and need to continue to do work before we are able to reach the uh, racial equity that our city uh, values include. Next slide, please. So these findings offer as many opportunities to celebrate for sure. Our city continues to grow. Uh, its growth is rivaling some of the nation's largest cities. Uh, growth in, high, in, in housing is the highest it's ever been, and we saw growth among all of our communities, yielding increased diversity for our city. Next slide. But the data also provide opportunities for reflection. There is continued geographic segregation among our city's different racial communities. There's also a concurrent farther eastward movement of the population with increasingly higher shares of non-Hispanic white population in historically black and brown neighborhoods. Additionally, our housing rate growth decreased between 2010 and 2020, giving the city's long trends of, of, of strong and sustained growth. We really need to make sure that our housing growth is able to keep pace with our population growth. And then populations of color led growth throughout the country and throughout the state. And we're seeing a unique pattern of diversity here in the city of Austin, including a decline among black and Latino children. This is something to be curious about because for all communities to be able to fully participate in the celebration of these results, we must first seek to understand what is contributing to this unique pattern of diversity in our city and this continued geographic segregation only then do we get closer to living our values of racial equity. Next slide, please. Now, before I turn it over to our panel, our distinguished panel, to offer their reactions to these findings, I want to take the time to offer my, my gratitude. I wouldn't be up here sharing these findings with you today were it not for the combined efforts of hundreds of volunteers, government and nonprofit staff members, local media partners, and of course, the support of the city and the county. This was one of the most challenged censuses, as we've mentioned, all of the speakers have mentioned before. Um, but you persisted and brought unwavering determination and innovative solutions to fully counting our communities because you understand the value of these data. So thank you for your leadership and your service. So I would like to say that we're all doctors here tonight, but Dr. Valencia really is a doctor and we appreciate that presentation that she just gave us. Um, as she mentioned, we're now gonna move into a panel discussion with leaders of our community CCCs. So if you all can come up, we'll begin the discussion. So I think you all know who you are. Yeah. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Um, we're gonna start with introduction. So I will pass the microphone. I will start over here. With Kurt. Constable George Morales. Alice, Alice Yee with the Asian Complete Account Committee. Avesa Har with the LGBTQIA plus uh, Complete Count Committee. Anthony Brady with the African American Complete Count Committee. Veronica Ramirez with the Latino Complete Count Committee. Great. Thank you all. So we have a series of of questions, we'll try to have a casual conversation. Um, questions are open to anybody who wants to answer them. So from where I sit, I work for a governmental entity and one of the hardest things we have is how do we get people to participate? The census especially, I think, is something that we've heard of. We all know that it's important, but what does it really mean? Um, the challenge for us was getting people motivated to join and help with this effort. So I would love to hear from our panel how on earth did you become involved with the Austin census motion or movement in 2020? Who would like to take that one first? I'll, I'll start. Um, so I actually uh, came on board through the Hispanic uh, Chamber of Commerce, through the Hispanic Austin Leadership Program. Um, I was part, our group was tasked with taking on um, a community event or, or role and the census just happened to be coming up. So. Um, naturally, our group was like, well, let's, let's see what we can do to help the census. Um, so we got in touch with John and 
John had big dreams for us, um, but we needed more leadership, <laughs> which, you know, Constable George will talk about he, how he became involved. But that's how I, I got involved was through um, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. And um, for those of you that don't know, I'm her husband. <laughs> At that time, her boyfriend. So um, because we were uh, in close quarters, I saw her working diligently all the time about it. And I come from a community activist background uh, from my time I spent in D.C. before I got here. And they let me help out a little bit. So that's when I got connected with the Urban League and started participating in the African American Complete Count Committee. Thank you. So... I got involved because there was a great team of staff members um, who were working on the LGBTQIA uh, Complete Count Committee. They were setting it up. We were sort of the last one to be formed. Um, and we had help from Councilmember Flanagan's office, who was representing District 6 at the time, and his chief of staff, Marty Byer. But a lot of these folks were talking about, what do we do? And if folks remember, there was this big back and forth at the federal government where sexual orientation and gender identity were supposed to be added as questions into the 2020 census. So there was explicit excitement among the LGBTQIA plus community. But as it got rolled out, what we heard from the Trump administration at the time was that those questions were no longer going to be added. So there was a lot of confusion and angst among the community and I think community, and I think that was what really brought me to this work because we were seeing on the ground repercussions of how people were responding overall to the idea of the census. And since I was work, working as a partner with the Asian Pacific American Vote for past uh, eight years, and uh, we try to get our community get out to vote. So when API voted to doing the education tour nationwide uh, 2019 and uh, started July, actually the initial meeting started March 2019, so we kicked off open our Asian Complete Account Committee at July 2019, had it trained by the, the professionals and uh, get education, and I feel like this is uh, my duty and uh, our uh, responsibility to get our community to be counted. So for, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to John Lawler um, because a lot of this effort was was put together by him and and the hard times we as a group gave him for John. Um, how I got involved with the um, Latino Count Committee was um, I was uh, in a surprise meeting, believe it or not, with uh, Maria Campos from the Census Bureau, um, Jose Garza, our district attorney now, and uh, John Lawler they showed up to my office and wanted to meet with me and, and really wanted to get together about focusing on um, areas that were hard to reach and um, areas that, uh, you know, I think we all follow the same platform of people who look like us, talk like us, and, you know, familiar faces. So that's how I got involved in it. So I'm curious. We sat through the presentation, and it's one thing to see, I think, our communities down on the ground. It's another thing when we see them kind of distilled into data. So I'd be curious to hear from you all, what was the most surprising thing that you heard in the presentation, and does it match with what you thought the outcome was going to be? Who would like to take that one first? I see George wanting to say something. <laughs> I, I thought the African American count was surprising to me. Um, because where we're at, I mean, obviously in the Eastern Crescent is where we target a lot of our areas and our, and our really important zip codes where we're hard to reach zip codes. Um, I thought that we would have seen more of a growth. Um, but, and, and, it's, and it's weird because our task was the Latino Complete Count Committee, right? But when you're doing the census, it's anybody's role that you run into, whether you're African American, Asian, LGBTQ, anybody we, we, we fell into and we met with them our goal was to try to get them registered for the census. Hi. With, with regards to the data I saw, aside from the African-American um, count or, or numbers that came in, a lot of it wasn't surprising. I think a lot of it is what we saw as we constantly were updating our numbers on our end um, weekly and, and seeing what numbers were coming in. Um, what was really interesting to me was uh, the growth 
between the other certain cities. So the growth in Fort Worth with, with Latinos and Hispanics, I'm, I'm curious if that's interstate growth or if that's out of state growth. Um, you know, I'd be also curious to see where our population went, you know, and I know we saw some that went to the Eastern Crescent and, and it makes sense because even we left a predominantly historic black community and moved further south in, in the Southern Crescent of the city. I mean, as, as far south as you can go in Travis County. So um, I get it. I mean, we, we participated in that movement. So I, I understand those numbers, um, but I would like to see the growth of, or, or the interstate, if there's interstate movement within those cities and stuff. I'd probably echo uh, Veronica's sentiments about uh, the African-American numbers as well. I know internally we have conversations. I'm from, I came here from New York. A lot of people from the East Coast or from um, the West Coast work in tech. I work in tech as well. They ask questions about where should I be considering relocating. And one of the questions that I have to bring up or have to answer all the time is, would you recommend moving to Austin as a black person? And um, I would like to say yes. Sometimes I say it depends for the most part, because if you're going to just bring yourself and work in tech, that's a completely different experience than being an African-American who's not working in tech and looking to find a community um, here that's gonna be open to accepting you. Are you gonna be able to find jobs that are gonna be able to afford housing and things like that? Um, how much savings do you have? Do you have any wealth at all? And so that part wasn't really surprising, but I would like to see some income numbers paired with those numbers as well, just to see if there's any uh, insights to be gained from that. The most surprise to me is our Asian American uh, population growth. And uh, Texas become the third largest uh, Asian population in the whole country. This is a really surprise. And also, our locally, the diversity and the ethnic uh, diversity is another thing surprised me. And uh, another good thing is um, we have extra congressional seats. Thank you. Uh, I would pretty much echo what everybody has said. I think I agree with all of those points. The only other thing I would add is I was surprised to see that our housing growth has not kept pace with our population growth. It seems like our population growth is pretty massive. It's amazing to see that. Um, but at the same time, we're not keeping up with the housing growth, which I'm kind of surprised to see. Uh, but I think is an important thing to consider. And another thing that just struck me as looking at it was just how much of the nationwide growth was in Texas. It was all of these amazing you know, places that we know in Texas. So you know, I'm gonna, I'm a longhorn. I'm just gonna say it right, like we always talk about what starts here changes the world. And it seems like we're really starting something here with a lot of growth. Texas is you know, gonna be an important force to reckon with and we already knew this. So I know it's an understatement to say it, but it was going to be a challenging census Regardless of everything that happened in 2020, I, I think we already knew going into it, we were gonna have a hard time getting people to be motivated to participate, especially with the question hanging over our heads about whether or not there would be a citizenship question. From the county and the city, we had undertaken this process in 2010 in a much smaller scale and knew that 2020 really needed to ramp up, especially in light of that. Um, I would be curious to hear from you all on the ground. You know, everybody was dealing with a transitioning time period in, in 2020. How did that impact what you guys were doing? How did that, what did you have to do to sort of adapt to those changing times, especially when we went to suddenly having all of these events that were gonna be in person um, to suddenly not? Everybody was kind of stuck at home and we're trying to count everybody at, at home, but how do we do that when we can't leave? So who would like to take it first? I have to give a shout out to my wonderful team and a partner right there and the summit. And, uh, <laughs> and our team, we really, Asian American is the hardest to count because of our language barrier, because of the mistrust and the misinformation. The mistrust of the government, everybody knows how much pressure we got. And also pandemic coming, so we also quickly changed this is again our wonderful team quickly changed to digital meetings, uh, seminars, and uh, all everything online. And uh, there's uh, another 
good support is outside of Texas. We got some uh, funding, so we have uh, thanks to Travis County and State of Austin give us a uh, funding. So we can afford to change, to make the change, to hire people to do the digitally. I would say technology in general has changed from 2010 to 2020. Uh, 2010 was the very beginning of social media moving outside of the college ecosystem and kind of becoming ubiquitous with regular people. And so having that platform and the ability to do um, live streaming and things like that directly within platforms where the eyeballs already were because they were stuck at home was uh, something that was positive. Um, one other thing that emerged really early on is the census tract data that Steve and his team were pulling together. Veronica was working to pull that together as well. And we would pass that information over to Constable Morales and Constable Morales just delivers results. Whatever it is that needs to get done, he's gonna get out there and get it done. COVID census, everything else. So all of those things working together really contributed to us being able to be a little bit more efficient than we probably could have been in the absence of all those things. Um, I can speak towards you know the different tactics that we did that, that had to become digital friendly. Um, so we, we did the podcasts online um, and invited people from the community to come on to talk about the census or to talk about you know current events that were impacting our community. Um, um, come on and talk about COVID as well once, once that started wrapping up. And um, so we had the podcast. Uh, it also was collaborating with the other CCCs. Um, we had one huge large event where we brought in um, um, DJ talent, we brought in, um, um, I guess you would call it rapper, local, local musicians to kind of spread the word. Um, and that was, that was a huge hit for us. We also created a weekly event that was digital um, and just trying to be creative with it, uh, doing as much social media as we can, um, but I think like looking at the numbers and, and, and once COVID happened, um, I echo what Anthony said, what it really is still just getting in, in on the ground and Constable George and his team with Travis County, you know, they were out there handing out PPE um, um, supplies and um, getting the information to, to the community and capitalize on every forward facing opportunity they had within, within the community. So, uh, he can speak more to that, but it, it really was like, oh, you're doing this? Okay, well, how can we also get a leaflet in there? Or how can we get them printed? <laughs> um, and how can we get them delivered to him? So how can we get them approved to be delivered? So it was also learning um, a lot of the uh, red tape that came with what we can do, what we can't do, and trying to balance these two important issues, understanding that one was an actual pandemic that was impacting um, you know, especially for us, the Latino Hispanic community at a larger, faster rate. I also will say that these numbers, um, I'll be the first, I can admit, I was talking to my husband about this, that I was ignorant to the funding behind the census um, before I became involved with the census. And it just is so jarring that it happened to coincide with a pandemic and to see where we had distribution locations or, um, um, access to um, testing and how a lot of that information is pulled from census data and why it is so important for us to complete the census data and to really put effort and funding behind our groups, especially seeing the information that Dr. Valencia talked about. And, and if we are growing at, a, at, a, at such a diverse rate, we should be contributing to those diverse communities as well. Sorry, one other thing to um, mention as well, um, because I didn't necessarily see them up there, but the um, Greater Austin Urban League as well had a really heavy hand, as well as individuals like Mercedes Perry and uh, Neil Whetstone. Without them, couldn't have got it done. I'll just, you know, honestly, this is a tough question. There's so many things that went wrong. It was, it was a slow moving train that we didn't know where it was going, and we were all in it. It was not fun, honestly, to be on that <laughs> ride. I but it was never going to end, right? It, it, yes. And then we kept thinking it was going to end. That was the mistake that we made. We were like, oh, it, 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 
I know. And we were like, oh, well, two months we'll be able to do events. And I was like, no, three months we'll be able to do No, four months. No, we won't be able to do events. And I think that was a big challenge for the LGBTQIA plus uh, committee, particularly our community isn't geographically focused in one part of our county. Or if it is, we don't have the data to know it. So we couldn't be targeting geography. What we were going to target was businesses and events. So, but then Austin Pride doesn't happen. All of our bars shut down. All of these establishments, businesses where people come are shutting down. And so really the healthcare facilities were one of the few places left for us to physically reach out to people. It had to move all virtual. Um, and one thing I'll add is, I, I hate to bring it up again, but the federal government did not help us through this process. I think the immigration question was really just looming over our head. There was so much misinformation over, honestly, more than a year for us to counter, that was really hard. In telling people that that is not part of the uh, you know, equation here, that they, they cannot come after you, that it does not impact your immigration status. Also related to, honestly, the gender question and gender identity sexual orientation question. There was a lot of trouble. I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna say trouble, but I guess just issues that were not, our, our Census Bureau at the federal government was not helping us. I think our partners here on the ground in Texas were really helpful in guiding us in what we could or could not do. But that was just a really big challenge um, that we had. Um, <clears throat> I think we, uh, we knew how we can be unique in different ways and come up with great ideas. It's like you open up a bag of Legos and you try to see what you can create, right? And so first, um, you know, when, when you know, I, I never had to use the title as, hey, I'm an elected official. But during the census, um, one person that really helped in that area was uh, doing our uh, vehicle registration was our tax assessor, Bruce Elfont. And I want to give him a round of applause because he jumped in there. <clears throat> and I remember when the money wasn't there and uh, Bruce was just a great guy. He's like, oh, I'll just give you the money. Just pay me later. You know, <laughs> one, of those, one of those deals like that, when you get so much support and you're motivated to when you're distributing PPE or when you're distributing lunches with ASD and we're doing podcasts and, and we're working with, and, and remember, we're working as a team up here. So we're, we're helping each other to try to, okay, this is what I'm doing. You can do this too. You know, we're sending mail. We're, we're you know, a lot of people were afraid because we were at the peak of the pandemic. So we're like, we're not gonna go knock on nobody's doors. Well, at one time when we were getting closer and closer to the deadline, some of us had to bite the bullet and go lit drop. So, you know, those were the things that we had to step up and do. But, you know, again, when we started this, it's, it's like a big old Lego box. You, you, you gotta think of ideas, how you're gonna create this, this masterpiece, right? But <clears throat> even getting started, where are your Legos? Alice E, you know? <laughs> she provided the Legos for us. So, you know, from that point on, the ideas of technology, radio, media, then PPE, food distribution, um, even just basic education to our community, you know, being out there with our teams and, and you know, poor John, you know, you're going to hear me say poor John a lot because John's like, well, what do you think? And I was like, look, John, just make sure our teams are getting paid. We're going to be okay. So, but I mean, he did a great job. You know, this team did a great job and, and, and they deserve a lot of applause and, 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 and an acknowledgement for what they did. Um, Dr. Valencia, you know, targeting those zip codes you know, um, Veronica and Anthony, we knew they were there. <clears throat> we just didn't know which zip codes. So we were trying to use the census track and we we're trying to compress it, Alice, remember this? And we we're like, where are the, we, we know our neighborhoods. And we reached out to Dr. Valencia. She's like, okay, these zip codes and like, oh, those are our zip codes. Those, those are the ones we wanna track. Those are the ones we wanna focus on. So it kind of came together as a big piece. It's a big puzzle piece. And, and it started to work out and to benefit all of us. I think we might have time for one more question, then we'll open it up to the floor. Um, good, I'm getting signal, that's okay. This is a little self-serving for me. Um, I would love to know from you all what we should start looking ahead to for the 2030 census. How can we start planning to be even more successful than we were this time? Um, and really, more importantly, what, what skills and <laughs> Skills and tactics did you learn from the census and participating in this that have been carrying forward and that you're still using today? I, I can tell. <laughs> you need to start funding now. City of Houston, Texas was ready with funding millions of dollars, millions of dollars. And we had 
$600,000, somewhere around there, give or take. Imagine they had 10 years, they were ready, they were ready to go get it, and I don't know if we beat them with, with what we had. We just had you know, what we call the, the uh, Green Bay Packers Lombardi Group where nobody wanted us, and we made it happen. But that's what you got, you gotta start now. 10 years from now, we should have a whole Census Bureau for the city of Austin, not, not Texas or the United States, and Travis County. And, and, Travis County. and, and, and make it, and I'm a Travis County employee. <laughs> so we have to have that now. We have to have the funding now, get started now, start developing, because I guarantee you, you know, with, with the population, population growth, it's gonna get that much more difficult if we can't start now. That was a great answer. We'll start working on that now. <clears throat> I agree. I agree. Funding is very important. So we need to really get a, a legislature to put money on the side for the next uh, next round. And uh, education. This is a really need to educate grassroots efforts, education. I hope uh, I'm not going to be involved. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I'll completely agree with that. I think we do need the resources to build the capacity now. I think we were really trying to build capacity as we were trying to count people and get them to be counted. It was really hard. So I think having the resources to build that capacity now would be just a game changer. That's one thing. And I think the other thing I would add is I would encourage really the county and the city to do what they did with this team of having these population specific complete count committees in going out and talking the way they need to talk with their own communities, bringing them in the way they need to be brought in, I honestly think that was a game changer. And having budget specific to those committees to be able to do their work, I would definitely highly encourage us to do that again and maybe even scale it up because it was really critical to getting this work done. Um, my, my mind works in the marketing capacity, so I, I would say start creating the branding for a, a county census outreach um, now. I think one of the issues we spent a lot of time was that how do people know that we are with the census? What what identity do we stand behind? And that's when we created, uh, you know, Contamos and um, um, it was more identifiable. And I think that's what El Paso did really well is that they had a whole brand behind their census outreach. Um, also, I think looking at the demographics or look at the new numbers and seeing like how young, um, our population is, um, they're gonna be turning adults soon. So what are we doing now to reach that, that demographic and encouraging them to complete the census? Because I can tell you when I turned 18 or when I was in college, again, I was ignorant to, to the census and, and the importance of it. So um, ju just seeing how large that young population is that's gonna be coming of age in the next 10 years, um, capitalize on it. How do we capitalize on it? Um, and echoing what um, Constable Morales is starting now and taking like these, these relationships that we have started, that we have built, the new people within the community who've, who've activated and are, continue to be activated within the, the community, um, maintaining those relationships, not in 10 years from now, but you know, doing check-ins throughout the year leading up to the census, I think is very important because John was tasked with the role what, I think maybe the year of 2020, and had to figure out a way to find all of us and bring us all together, and and, and he did, he managed it, but um, no one expected a pandemic, and you imagine what we could have done if we knew each other before then. I would probably recommend um, thinking bigger than the census, because the census is super important, um, but if you go into these neighborhoods and talk to these people and think about what it is that they would like to see coming from these communities, then you can build something that doesn't end when the census is over. You can build a mechanism that continues to grab information from those people and you bring the right parties together and provide solutions that are gonna directly impact those uh, communities because you, know, you think about the housing issues that we have those are the same problems that are gonna exist whether it's census time or not. So find out what they need and find a group of people that can continue to participate in the process beyond the census. Okay, I think we have time for maybe one audience question and I see Sumit, so I'm gonna come grab or come over here and give you the microphone. Fairly loudly without the mic. 
Um, <laughs> actually, uh, mine is not so much a question. I'm sorry, I don't have a question, but really a comment. Uh, this is all very good news, et cetera, mm -hmm. but I want to back up a little, take a few minutes. I worked on the 2010 census when, the, when folks in Washington was very supportive. They were very supportive, and three of us, just three of us, counted the entire South Asian community. Much smaller then, but we did it. Just three people, because we got so much support. Not money, but all kinds of other support. Mm -hmm. When we did this, uh, I was not just a co-conspirator, I was also the data analyst for the Asian community. And uh, one of the things we found out as we moved to social media is that there's a huge separation between different areas of the city. Mm -hmm. The amount of electronic you know, abilities we have in the city is very, very unbalanced. Mm -hmm. So we had great success. You know, what we did was we took a, a zip code map and a track map and we mapped it on top of each other and we found out where the Asians live. Mm -hmm. And there's a large percentage that live around Lamar Runberg. Mm -hmm. These are with the new immigrants, the undocumented, etc. And these people don't have iPads, laptops, smartphones. And that was like a dark zone. We had very poor success in that area. So if you're planning for 2030, mm -hmm. plan to make sure that it's a level playing field. We will use the same techniques. We used vote map to reach out with ads to smartphones. We will need that kind of technology if we want to count everybody in this city. We are undercounted, and that's the reason is the large sections of the city that mm -hmm. don't have electronic access. Exactly. So that's the challenge for the next 10 years. Oh. I'm hoping we'll have that solved by then, but I, I know that's wishful thinking. All right, well, if you all will join me giving a huge round of applause to our panelists and all the work that they did throughout the census and will hopefully be doing uh, well into the next census in 2030. Um, thank you all again so much for being here. This really was a community effort and it didn't hinge on just one person, but it, it really did take each and every one of us making it the success that it was. I know it can be better, but I have to tell you on those dark days and. 2020, I didn't think that there was light and that it would be as good as it was. And it's, you know, it's one of those things that it makes you kind of get teary-eyed when you think about it. There were a lot of tears, so it's good to have happy tears as a result of the census. Um, just as a reminder, the proclamation will be tomorrow morning at 9.30. You can visit that online at austintexas.gov slash ATXN. Um, very special thank you again to Mayor Pro Tem Alter and Council Member Natasha Harper-Madison, who was... Um, not able to be here with us tonight, but thank you again, everybody, and be on the lookout. 2030 Census is coming your way sooner rather than later. Thank you. All right. Thank you all.